if you've read my book or skimmed through my book, you know that Los Gatos is kind of the end of my third section. I end with Vasona Junction, which is just uh, north of here. Uh, and that was intentional. Um, I consider Los Gatos to be kind of the start of Santa Cruz County's railroading history um, because that is where in 1909 the Mayfield cutoff, which went to Palo Alto, split with the Los Gatos branch, but it's also kind of where the struggle of getting through the mountains really began. And this talk is going to be very interesting because it's much more like my book actually is. All my other talks I've given while I've been here, uh, I've given three other ones, they've really focused on the actual history of the railroad. This one is actually going to talk about the history of Los Gatos in its early years, with the railroad being kind of the means of explaining that history. And that's how my book is. My book is a more of a place history. I, I say that I lie on my cover because I call it Santa Cruz Trains, but really I see the trains as the glue that kind of brings the communities together. And so my book is really talking about the history of the communities such as Los Gatos, and how the trains help build that community, and how it's kind of interesting in almost all the cases nowadays, how the trains eventually reach a point where they're no longer necessary, the community can kind of live on its own. And Los Gatos is certainly like that. The train that was here, um, the last train, or the train left here in, oh man, I'm now blanking off the top of my head because this isn't in my talk. 59, I believe, is what left the downtown area and 64 is, uh, is when it, uh, the station left at uh, Vasona Junction. So since then, there's been no railroad service. I know there's been talk for years about getting the Campbell Line extended for a light rail, but, there's a, but the community here is a railroad community. It just doesn't have a railroad anymore. <laughs> and so that's really what my talk's gonna be about. But before I start, just to go on to, to the, uh, the theme of a community, I want to ask you a question. I'll see uh, you guys raise your hands. Where is the center of Los Gatos? In your mind, if you're local or not, what do you consider to be the center of Los Gatos? Main Street, roughly where we are right now, or Santa Cruz Avenue? So if you think it's Main Street, raise your hand. Are you talking geographic center? Ah, or? you're already getting to, you're, okay. you're reading ahead. <laughs> so how many people think it's Santa Cruz Avenue? I would agree. And nowadays, I think that's very true. I think today it is. This talk will explain to you exactly why that is and why you're not right now feeling like you're in downtown, even though you're actually where pretty much the county or the local government is. I mean, the library's there. We're in a building that used to be the library. Right next door is the city council chambers. I mean, this is the heart of the town, but almost none of you actually think this is the heart of the town, and that's very interesting. <laughs> so during my talk, I'm gonna talk about, uh, I'm gonna start with Lexington, and I'll explain in more detail why, but Lexington is where Los Gatos' history really starts. Uh, Forbes Folly, that is gonna be here, uh, South Pacific Coast, the railroad, uh, then this is where things are going to get interesting. So switching banks, changing faces, Grove Park, Gem of the Foothills, and a postscript because we've got to end on an interesting note there. So Lexington, you all know of the reservoir, it's just, north, or it's just south of here, but Lexington was a town. It is the town that was here before Los Gatos. Before there was any idea of a community here, in 1847, Zachariah Buffalo Jones founded a mill. It was before we were even a state. This is still, a, let's see, in 47, this is still a territory. Uh, in fact, we may, actually, I don't even think we were taken over uh, from Mexico officially yet. So in 1847, this started off as a mill. And I'm not talking about this location, we're talking two miles to the south in the middle of Lexington Reservoir, right where that dam is, and just down at the bottom of it. The deepest part, that is Lexington. And so, yeah, you're not gonna be visiting this town. Lexington officially got founded in 1860, um, and it was, it, so it started off as a mill town, it always was a mill town, but in 1860, a guy named, sorry, I gotta look up his name now, ah, right, uh, John P. Henning and Lucian B. Healy, they got this idea that we're gonna create a small city here, very similar to how Los Gatos is today. They wanted to do this two miles to the south in the bottom of Lexington Reservoir, basically. But back then, it was a, this idea, there's a lot of land there. It was a pretty big floodplain, so they wanted to build a community here. So they named it Lexington. It was uh, uh, he uh, Henning's hometown was um, Lexington, Missouri. So they wanted to name it Lexington. And by this point, Jones was pretty much out of the picture and so there was room for growth. 
the mills that founded this town were already moving up into the hills. They were moving in all directions, um, a little less up limestone or lime kiln gulch because there is not, there's never been a lot of trees there, but they were definitely moving up uh, into the mountains along Bear Creek Road, along what 17 is today. So they're moving up and out. But the good thing is a lot of people had to run these things. So the town was actually growing pretty big uh, by the eight, uh, late 1860s. But so things started moving pretty fast. It started as a stage stop. And the stage stop went up uh, to the summit. And it started in here, Los Gatos, just across the street. But that's not where the original toll house was. The original toll house for this was over in Lexington. And it was founded in 1857 as the Santa Cruz, Joint St Santa Cruz Gap Joint Stock Company. And its entire purpose was to get people from here to Santa Cruz. Now, if it was a good day and there wasn't a lot of mud, a stagecoach could pretty much run their horses to exhaustion and get you there in four hours. So you could do it in one day. A lot of people didn't want to do that, though, because, you know, killing your horses is expensive. So what they would do is they'd stop at the ridge, uh, they'd stop in Patchen, they'd stop at Mountain Charlie's little hut, basically, or they'd stop at the community that later became Glenwood. And then they'd spend the next, day, or the next morning coming down to town. And so at this point in time, what's now today Los Gatos, in fact, Santa Cruz Avenue, that was known as the Lexington Turnpike, that was known as... Uh, just the Santa Cruz, San Jose Road, or vice versa, which is how you get Santa Cruz Avenue today. And, but all the activity was up in Lexington. So by 1873, there are eight different lumber companies operating in the Lexington area. And then they started getting consolidated. One by one, they got bought out. And it got very interesting because this company called the Santa Clara Mill and Lumber Company, run by two brothers, William and James Doherty, they merged all these operations into one thing, and that's why I call it Doherty's Town, because for about 10 years, this town was still kind of thriving, but it was a complete company town. The Doherty's owned almost everything in town that was worth owning. They owned a general store, they, owned, or they financed things like the, um, the school. They pretty much controlled this town, even if they didn't own it directly, they controlled it. But the problem is, the lumber kept moving further into the hills. And once it moves into the hills too far, it's no longer profitable for them to be staying in Lexington. And so what happened in about 1878, they, that's when Bear Creek Road was pretty much founded, 1877, 78, because they needed to get to the headwaters of Zianti Creek, which is on the other side of the summit. So they made this road all the way up to the summit so they could go over it and start harvesting the lumber there. That was not profitable. And the railroad actually solved their problem is slightly getting ahead, but the railroad ended up going straight through Zioni Creek. So in 79, uh, all of Doherty moved. By that point, there weren't a lot of people in the town, and Lexington just started to disappear as a town. Some people still live there, but all the old families left. They either moved to Los Gatos, they moved over to Doherty Mill in Zianti, or they just moved out of the area entirely. And the, uh, and when they left, the post office moved in 73. They moved to Alma, which was also under Lexington Reservoir. It's just another mile uh, to the south. And yeah, once the people started moving, the stage uh, stops moved also. And once the railroad started getting built, the stage stops, well, they only needed to be at the end of the line because then the trains could take them to that point. And so then they just kept moving. So once Lexington kind of got past, everything moved on, and it really did get past. The railroad ignored Lexington. When they started going through here in 1878, they went on the other side of the creek. And I'm sure that they tried to build a bridge, but they completely ignored Lexington. They went to Alma. And Alma, in 1878, became the new center of what I like to call the, the um, Upper Los Gatos Creek Basin. The, everything on the other side of Cats Canyon, that where Lexington Reservoir is today, Alma became the new center, and Lexington just disappeared. And its population, let's see, in 1870 at its height, its population was 200. Uh, the census doesn't have any data for its population in 1880, because it had just become a suburb of Los, uh, Los Gatos. So you can't actually figure it out anymore. So that's a big change. Like, in 10 years, it had just disappeared. But you're already seeing where this is heading. This is going to Los Gatos. So before I move on, this is supposed to be a photo essay, so I've got to give you some photos. So here's a few homesteads in the Lexington area. 
Uh, just two of them, and there's one up on the hill there. This is either a private road, but this is actually probably this whole road right here. It wasn't exactly top of the line modern uh, technologies, but this is the 1860s, maybe the early 1870s. Here's another view. This is probably the only image that we have of the entire town site, but this is the 1880s. So this is after it had already declined. Most of its buildings had been abandoned or demolished by this point. So you get a little bit of the town there. Uh, Lusgaus Creek would be in the middle, kind of meandering. Uh, the schoolhouse, uh, Lexington School, I believe they're on their third Lexington School, although this, uh, this one got moved. So officially they're on their second building now, uh, and it's up above the Lexington Reservoir. But the original one was between Lexington and Alma. It was founded in 1859 by uh, Henning, and that's where all the kids in the valley were uh, taught for 30, 40 years. 50 years. And there's just a fun class photo. All the boys are up on the bridge for some reason, but all the girls are <laughs> down below next to the creek. So, <laughs> And then this is the oxen team. Uh, you'll notice these are tourists. Uh, there's maybe family members, but there's definitely a bunch of women and a couple guys in a fancy dress up uh, on this log that the oxen are hauling. So this is very much a staged photo. And then this is the Turnpike Toll House. It was built in 1867, uh, the building was, and this is how everyone who wanted to go to Santa Cruz had to go through this toll house. Uh, Jones tried originally, jo uh, Zachariah Jones built a diversion that kind of goes through where the novitiates above town is. They go two miles up that ridge and down Lime Kiln Gulch, or Canyon, and it just, it was a pain. The stagecoaches did not take it very well. So as soon as they got enough people that could do a, a joint stock company, they made a new one. And this is how Highway 17 still pretty much follows this. It was a little teeny bit higher up on the ridge in some parts. But 17, for the most part, still follows this to get into uh, the upper basin. And so, and this was the house, I believe this was the house that was actually built in Los Gatos, not the one that was at Lexington. Uh, photos of Lexington are extremely hard to find. And even the ones that we have, we're not always 100% sure if it's actually Lexington. But this one we know is the Toll House. And then this is just one of the ranches. This is later. This is 1897. But this is one of the ranches that was in the Lexington area. You can see the hills up there. Pretty barren at this time. That is another interesting thing to note. Uh, all of the Lexington area became ranch and agriculture lands. They had orchards. This was Alma, too. And it's because the Doherty Company and the other logging concerns dynamited almost all the stumps. This valley would have been almost all old growth redwoods originally. Mm -hmm. You go there today, there's some old growth, I mean, there's some new redwoods way up in the valley, but the valley itself where they put the dam, they didn't have to chop down stuff, at least not very much, because <laughs> they were all dynamited. You dynamite the stumps and nothing grows back and then they just plant uh, orchards or they have ranches like this. So Forbes, so we're talking about Lexington. So Forbes, uh, and why is it his folly? Well, his folly, well, first, Los Gatos. Los Gatos started as a rancho. Its, it's uh, southern border is basically the entrance of Cats Canyon. So we're near its southern border. Uh, it really just means wild cat corner, wild cat something. Uh, Rinconada is a strange word, uh, even in Spanish today. Uh, it was granted in 1838 to Jose Hernandez and Sebastian Peralta, and it was, it was officially registered a few years later. But in 54, they decided to lease out some of their land to this guy named Alexander, James Alexander Forbes. He wanted to build a flour mill here. All right, well, you can build a flour mill. Problem is he had no experience with flour or the process of milling or really how to run a business at all. Um, so that lasted three years. So it's kind of funny that even today we call that structure just like two blocks over the Forbes mill because it was only the Forbes mill for about three years. They called it the Forbes mill throughout all history, but Forbes only actually ran a mill there for about three years and he did not succeed. And the building that's there today is only the front of it and Forbes never owned that little section. The rest of the mill has, uh, was demolished a long time ago. So nothing at the Forbes mill has anything to do with Forbes except for the fact that it used to be attached to a structure that he built. So he went bankrupt in 1857, but he had a lot of land. He was given almost half of the rancho. So he decided to do the smart thing. He's going to start subdividing it. 
And so he subdivides it, and by 1864, enough land had been purchased and built upon that what we call today Los Gatos was built. And you guys are all in the heart of it, because this is Los Gatos. Forget that stuff on the other side. That is the county road, that, or the turnpike road. You are in Los Gatos right now. In 1864, anything that happened in Los Gatos was on this side of the road, or this side of the creek. I say road because 17 is now where the creek used to be, so in my mind, the two are kind of strangely synonymous. Uh, the mill did become something. In 66, 1866, uh, the Los Gatos Manufacturing Company bought it, and they actually knew what to do. They had some people that were you know, skilled in flour making and, other, uh, and grinding other uh, meals, so they ran it for 20 years. And they did a good job with it. They, they uh, are the ones responsible for building the flume. I know little bits of the flume still survive up on the canyon, and there's a flume walk. They were the ones that built it in 1872, and what they did is they had a dam about a half mile north of Alma. So that'd be, what would that be, three and a half miles north or south of here? So they had a dam three and a half miles south, south here on Los Gatos Creek, and they built this box flume, and it went high up on the ridge, and then they had a little reservoir up near where the novitiates is, and then they'd have a pipe, and the pipe would hyper-pressure the stuff and send it down, and so when it hit the water wheel, it could actually go at a real speed. This is something Forbes could not figure out for the life of him, and so his water wheel most of the year was not spinning because he couldn't get enough pressure. And so Los Gatos Manufacturing Company figured it out, and so they actually were able to use the mill effectively. But you have to note that this town still wasn't Lexington. Lexington in the 1870s was still the big town in the area. It was starting to decline by the late 70s, but before the railroad project kind of started, it was still the heart of the area. Los Gatos is still this small community that's just slowly growing. Uh, in 1880, which is after the railroad came, there were only 555 residents, and that includes everyone to the south of here to the county line. So you're still getting not that big of a population. So this is just a picture of the rancho. Forbes Mill is actually on here. It's this little building right here. You can see Los Gatos Creek. Uh, much of Los Gatos Creek <coughs> follows where Highway 17 is today because they actually built right down the middle of the creek and culverted the creek away. Uh, yeah, and so the town, so both sides of this is basically where modern day Los Gatos is. This is the uh, Hernandez Adobe, uh, really the only painting we have of it. it, this, it you probably will have seen this painting before if you've done anything with Los, Los Gatos history. Um, and then these are some fun photos of the uh, Forbes Mill, just different ones. The eras of them, because the Forbes Mill was continuously built uh, upon and even after it was kind of stopped being used, it was still a very scenic spot, so people took lots of pictures. So like this one's from around, the 18, around 1890. You're looking across the field into it. This one's from the back. And yeah, there's a little store in the front. All right, here we go. The manufacturing company, there's a little store. So the mill itself was the whole building. The back of it is kind of where they did a lot of the processing. Looks like they have some, uh, those are horses. Looks like oxen. And then this is them building the uh, lumber flume. Or the lumber, the box flume. And then this is just some other things. These are just things that were in the early town before the railroad came. So we have the agri agricultural works. This is where we are basically standing to, or seated, seated today. This was here. And so just a, another business in town. And then this is where you really get the idea of east versus west. We're all on the east side of Los Gatos Creek. This is, this, this is all the east side. This is Main Street here, San Jose Road. They called it back then. I think that's Blossom Hill Road now. And so this is a thing, and here's, up here is the flour mill. And this is West Los Gatos. We have the 10 Mile House, which I'll show you in a second. 10 Mile House, that is it. And then it's just called the Lexington Road because that's what it did. It got people to Lexington, and it got people to Santa Cruz from Lexington. And you can get, so this is the town of Los Gatos looking southwest about 1875. Everything you see here, like the novitiates would be up here. You can see the whole town. And there is some stuff on the other side, but it's mostly homes at this time. This is the 10 Mile House. So the 10 Mile House was 10 miles from San Jose along the main road, the road that would become the turnpike just past the 10 Mile House. And so this was where, this was the only building really, the only commercial building on the West Bank before 1878. 
But I said I would get to the railroads eventually. Railroads really had an interesting impact on how Los Gatos developed. So the first teams uh, working for the South Pacific Coast Railroad, South Pacific Coast was a upstart, narrow gauge railroad founded to basically compete with the Southern Pacific. Southern Pacific had been here for really only a few years by this point, but they were already getting monopoly on all the local railroading. And so this guy, uh, James Fair, he got this great idea that I'm gonna use my millions of dollars I got from gold rush money pretty much, and I'm gonna build a narrow gauge railroad to try to compete with the Southern Pacific. So in 1876, he founded a company with some other people. They bought uh, a failing railroad um, to kind of start their business, and they built everything from Alameda Point, which is Oakland or so, uh, along the east side of the San Francisco Bay to San Jose, and then they went from San Jose to Santa Cruz, or at least that was the goal. And so when they were doing their alignments, it became pretty obvious early on that they'd be going to Los Gatos. And, but again, where is the heart of Los Gatos? It is on the East Bank at this time. And so when it first came to town, they accepted. It's on the East Bank, so we're gonna go on to the East Bank. And I'll show you some pictures here in a minute uh, to uh, help prove this to you, but the thing is, when they went on the East Bank, it started on the West, it crossed over uh, about a half a mile north of here, uh, it crossed over the river, and then they ran into two obstacles. They ran into pretty much really shaly, clayey soil just when they were entering Cats Canyon, and that completely messed everything up. They couldn't go that way, it just wouldn't work. The other side had rocks in the way, big rocks, but this side had soil that they literally could not build a train on, so they had to switch banks. And so what they did is they put it right through the 10 mile house. Well, the 10 mile house, the owner was okay with that. It was uh, John Linden who, uh, or yeah, John Linden who founded, basically founded the west side of Los Gatos. And he said, I will do this if you move my building over and give me just a little bit of money just to finalize this transaction. They did. So right now, across from the post office, across Santa Cruz Avenue, that's where it was moved. And so a 10 mile house was moved across there and they decided the railroad would be going right through uh, the west side of Los Gatos. And it was going to pretty much avoid the east side. And this will come back to haunt the town later. The depot was built in April 1878. Uh, regular passenger service began June 1st, 1878, so a couple months later. And another thing to note is Los Gatos was the terminus of the railroad, at least on paper. Uh, until May 15th, 1880, which is when the whole line to Santa Cruz opened. So for about two years, Los Gatos was the, the, the end of the line. So some fun photos just to show you. So this photo, this is of the east uh, part of town. Los Gatos Creek is here. The Forbes Mill is here. And if you look very closely, there's a track that goes right here. That was the original main line. So the railroad tracks are coming from up here, or so, you can't really see where they're coming from. And they turned, and they were gonna go across the creek here, and then move on. And so it went, the original tracks went right on the other side, so on the creek side of the Forbes Mill. See, even I'm calling it the Forbes Mill. It was not the Forbes Mill, it was the Los Gatos Manufacturing Company. <laughs> <laughs> this is where they crossed. This bridge, which is a very iconic bridge, a lot of people have photos of it, uh, a lot of postcards. As you can see, this is a nice color postcard. This bridge is crossing Los Gatos Creek. Um, actually, really, it's about a quarter mile from here, just in front of the mill. And during this time, it w was uh, the Los Gatos Ice and Power Company, so it keeps changing its name. But this was the original mainline track, narrow gauge going across the creek. Here's just some fun pictures of it. You can see the spurs. So at this, the time this was taken, these tracks actually, they'd separate, and then they'd go back together on the other side of the building, and they'd keep going. And here's proof that they kept going. This is the Main Street Bridge. It was built in 1882. There is a train under the bridge. It is on the wrong side of the bridge. It went under the bridge. The bridge was built after the train tracks were built. It went under the bridge, and they kept mining that. So on the about a mile up canyon, this thing would follow the Los Gatos Creek, or Los Gatos Creek about a mile south of here, and they continued to mine that clay. So the clay that ended up being this huge problem for the railroad to get this track there, well, it did have a huge benefit because you need some clay to make quicklime. 
cement, basically. And so to make quick lime, uh, quick lime, you need some clay. It helps as an extra adhesive with the lime, uh, the lime kiln process. Well, they have an ample source, just like a mile from here. So they were able to go and they turned that into actual business. And let me see when the company was founded. Bother, here we go. Uh, I do not have when it was founded. I have when it was closed though. It was closed in 1894. But they actually had kilns just on the west side um, of that bridge. So this bridge, just on the other side of it, there's a little spur and they actually had lime kilns over there for about 20 years. And the trains would go out there, and they'd get lime, and they'd bring it back to Lime Kiln. And then they also would pick up uh, materials from the Forbes mill because they were shipping stuff on the train. Here's just another picture. You can see the railroad tracks over here. And you can see there's a big open spot there so the train can fit under the bridge. And this is 1890, so this is later years. And then on the other side, this is a slightly later photo, but the station's the same. Uh, this is what the Lascada station looked like. It's a kid standing out front next to a luggage cart. And yeah, nice typical Victorian style. It was made for a South Pacific coast, but it very much matches the South Pacific and Southern Pacific style stations of the time. Uh, most of them have the ticket window is a little bit of a Victorian bay window thing. It's just a picture of a locomotive in case you, you need further proof that this is a train talk. Train. <laughs> but that was taken right in Los Gatos. And this one I wanted to show you. So I'm just going to show you a couple pictures going up uh, the valley. Because this, my talk's not about the valley per se, but I did talk about Lexington. So I'll take you up to Lexington. So this is a slightly fantastical photo. If anybody didn't notice why it's fantastical, it's because there's people walking in the tracks and there's a train coming. So that is not a smart thing. I've seen the original for this and there are not people on it. So somebody decided to <laughs> stick them on there on a nice little walk. You can see the flume up here. So this is the flume that used to run up along the hillside. It's winding its way all the way around the corner there uh, into uh, north of Lexington. This is the tunnel. This is, I believe there are only two pictures we have of this tunnel before it got demolished. I, there's a bunch of pictures of it when it's being demolished, but this one was taken in 1882, so very soon after the railroad was completed. And this tunnel was almost exactly where the Lexington Reservoir Dam is today. So this is under that. We're just slightly off from it. The thing is they daylighted it, which means they took the roof off and just let trains go right around it. So there's not a whole lot left except kind of just a barren hillside there today. But when they built this, they kept having problems because the flume actually ran just above it, just off, off uh, camera here. And when they were building it, they kept causing landslides and they kept knocking the flume out of commission. And that this time the flume was also providing some of the power to the, to the city. And so it was really causing problems. So uh, when they daylighted it, it really caused some problems because when they blew up the tunnel, uh, they blew up the town's power supply for a couple of weeks at least, and they had to reroute the water. Then this photo, I found this on the public, uh, San Jose Public Library's website. This is beautiful. I wish it were in color because most, or the thing that they're talking about is the stage road here. This is the uh, future Highway 17. This is the San Jose uh, Santa Cruz Road. But right in the foreground here, you can actually see railroad tracks hiding in the brush. And they're triple railed, which means you can tell this is from, and they actually dated it, but you could tell it's from this period from uh, 19, or 1895 to 1908. The tracks were triple railed so they could support both standard gauge and narrow gauge. And so you can see the three rails there. And so this is during the period that they were upgrading it. And so I wish this were in color because it's a, it would be beautiful with all the, the flowers blooming. And this is probably our last photo that that exists uh, from Bill Wolf's collection. And that's Lexington over there, and that's the train on the other side of the creek just ignoring it. Sad times, but Lexington, by this point, most of those buildings are probably in decay, and not many people are actually living in them or using them commercially. So, unfortunate what happened to that town, but Alma did well until the uh, 18, or 1950s when you know they flooded it out and forced everyone to move. <laughs> so, the railroad's decision to place this on the opposite side of the creek, it was really, it was a bold move that the railroad didn't intend, I mean, they didn't have their own plans to develop that side of town, but one person did, and that was John Linden, who owned the 10 Mile House, because he also owned almost all the land that's today Santa Cruz Avenue. And what he started doing is the railroad came to town, they built the station, 
He got his, his uh, hotel moved across the street, and the Ten Mile House suddenly became the Los Gatos Hotel. It got wings added in the early 1880s, and he started just subdividing everything, and he was a huge business district. And at first, it was mostly a freight district. It was kind of the, the grungier commercial business, you know, like blacksmiths and, uh, and wagon repairs and uh, lumber yards, things like that. But as the years progressed, the banks started moving there. The, in fact, the school moved over there onto School Street, which became University Avenue. And things just started developing. And then, well, I'll show you a picture of it in a second, but uh, the road up past it, so Main Street, Main Street keeps on going onto the other side, over that bridge that was built in 1882. And all of a sudden, people started moving there en masse. And well, I'll show you the picture in a second. Let's see what time. All right. Um, and yeah, so the bridge, the bridge was really the kind of transition point. Before then, they had some forms of bridges, but I'm sure it was pretty rugged. It was hard for wagons to get, because it's a, the creek gets pretty deep there. Uh, it's pretty low beneath the, uh, the city level. And so back then, if you wanted to get on the other side, the easiest way would probably be go up the, or down the creek a little ways and cross over over there. And so in 1882, that really became the great equalizer. All of a sudden, both sides of town were equally accessible. The west and the east side were both fully, you could cross over from one to the other without any problem. And that was a, that really helped develop the west side, but it also made it so everybody could just go over to either side to get their business. And railroad was the business. <coughs> so you go to the side that has the railroad, which would be on the other side of the creek. And then this is getting ahead a little, little bit, but it really just kind of was the final nail in the coffin for the east side of the creek, or the, the settlement on the east side of the creek. July 27th, 1891, almost everything on this side of the creek burned down. And this was not unusual. Towns burned down. In fact, the other side burned down multiple times, too. The thing is, they had the railroad to keep them revitalized. They, that side had to keep being active because the railroad went through there. That was not the case on this side. There was really no commercial reason why, to keep things going on this side. So obviously, the number of things have stayed on this side of the creek, but the development kind of stalled when it just kept going over on the other side. So 1891 was really where everything that had made the East Bank important was gone now. And so everybody who, when they're rebuilding, they're just going over there now. So, yeah, this, this map's a little messy, but so Los Gatos is right here. You can see the property. Note where this, the name for Los Gatos is. It's on the East Bank here. And you can see the Linden. Linden owns this whole area here. But it's not super developed yet. In fact, that black dot there is probably the uh, 10 mile house. And so this is just kind of, this is one of the last pictures we have of the east side before the fire burned it down. And it's pretty, I mean the hills aren't too developed, but you can see there's orchards up there, there's a number of nice houses all over the hills, and then the downtown is pretty thick. I mean, it's, it was a busy area. You can see the bridge over here too, and the creek down below it. And this is looking east, so you're again, this is from the West Bank, but you're looking across the bridge, and that's more, uh, more of the east side of town over there. It's from 1882, so it's not quite as developed. And then this is a sketch of the east side. And this is, if you're standing almost more or less where we are today, maybe just a teeny bit down the street a little bit more, but this is the turn at the end that would have gone across the bridge. And you know, it's a it's a thriving place. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's, it's kind of narrow, but you got a three-story building here. I mean, this is a nice little town, and it was definitely developing. So Lexington lost it, then East Los Gatos got it. And yeah, here's a parade. This is Memorial Day 1891, so right before the fire. Um, and yeah, you've got this whole group going in here. you got the going around the corner there, and the bridge again would be just over in the distance. But this is where it really is telling. So this is a Sanborn fire insurance map um, from 1884. Uh, I'm not, this has nothing to do with the fire. This has to do with development. So you can kind of see, this is two years after the bridge has been built, uh, six years after the railroad's been built. This map here is the West Bank, and this is the East Bank. And you can see here's the railroad tracks, the hotel, uh, or the Los Gatos Hotel is right here. And you can see some spotted houses. These are mostly, uh, or businesses. Those are mostly businesses here. And you got some here. They're kind of scattered around. 
things are things are developing, but still kind of slow. Yet over here, you got a lot more houses, and you can just see the map continues quite a ways. And Los Gatos Creek is there, so we're probably see Mill Street's here, so I think we're right in this area here. Uh, so you can just see there's there's more businesses on that side, and th there's a bigger scope for the East Bank at this time. I mean, this is a very small stretch. It's just mostly around Main Street on the West Bank. This is four years later. All of a sudden, this is three maps. This is one map that's separated into little sections. This is three maps that I've uh, put back together mostly. And this side of town, the, the creek is here. And it's still really heavily concentrated here, but the scope has moved. Now all of a sudden, everything's on this side of the river, I mean, of the creek. You've got Main Street is now going on both sides of Santa Cruz Avenue. It's called Santa Cruz Avenue, was it? That was Santa Cruz Road then. So Santa Cruz Avenue. It goes up farther, you have the cannery, the uh, Los Gatos Fruit Packing Company uh, had a big cannery uh, on Santa Cruz, between Santa Cruz and Ludenden Avenue. And you can just see that the development is really going, especially on this little stretch here, which even today is a pretty tightly, uh, I'd say tightly congested business area. Just that little stretch between Santa Cruz Avenue and the creek, or Highway 17 nowadays, um, there's a lot of little businesses tucked away there. And so just in four years, everything switched. And so here's photos of the other side. So this is from 1886, so between those two. And there's the bridge again, but now we're looking on the West Bank, and this is the hotel, the Los Gatos Hotel. And you can just see it, all that development over there. And the railroad tracks, this is the station right here. And the railroad tracks are just going right through the middle of this community. Um, and in case you don't know where the railroad tracks were in Los Gatos, where the post office is, that was basically the old yard. That was basically the old yard and all the parking lots, the continuous parking lots that go all the way between the, or behind the buildings on Santa Cruz Avenue, where does it even end? It ends at Oak Meadow, at Oak Meadow Park. All those parking lots is the railroad right away. In most of that section, there are two tracks there. In some places, there are even more than that. Um, There's an entire freight yard near Elm Street. It was a very packed area and so, all those became parking, and Los Gatos actually voted to have them turn into parking because they weren't getting enough business on the railroad. Um, and, but that was pretty much where all the traffic came into the, into the area in those days. And this is, this is that one that I was telling you on Broadway. Broadway, west side, look how tightly packed this is. This is 1885, so look how busy this is. It's becoming, it, this is very much becoming a big community on the West Bank. And then just yet another one. This is the hotel here, the station. Now we have the freight house also. The freight house wasn't in the previous one. Uh, number of bank buildings and stuff. The freight yard is actually right here, but it's hard to tell. And so it's becoming very busy in a very short period of time. We're talking less than 10 years. Here's the Los Gatos Hotel. Now it's in its proper place across the street where it, it became a part of the Los Gatos Hotel when they uh, expanded it, or Los Gatos Hotel became a piece of the much larger Los Gatos Hotel. Uh, Linden Hall ended up getting moved over and then demolished at some point. And then that burned down at one point and it became the Hotel Linden. And it was beautiful. It was this massive building that was demolished in the 60s. And so this is, it still, this is basically still the 10 mile house, but it's now across the street. This is the one photo we have that shows the turntable on Elm Street. And, and actually, this is the engine house over here. Um, they did have a full switch engine. The town had enough freight traffic between the manufacturing company uh, and later the ice and power plant. They, they still needed the train for the ice plant. Ice plant was basically for getting ice in a train. And then they could send uh, cold foods over, or not foods, um, produce. They could send orchard produce uh, from local to San Jose and San Francisco and whatnot without it going bad. And so that's what the cold pl or ice plant was mostly for. And so they would still go across the street to, or across the creek to get that. They had the cannery, which honestly should probably be visible somewhere in this, but I don't see it on here. I have another picture of the cannery. And then there's also a number of other concerns that developed over the years that would use freight. Um, and there's always a lumber yard, even until until the line uh, ceased, there was a lumber yard that was right next to the tracks in this area. 
And so the turntable, right, was it you? The turntable was used to turn trains. Originally, it was used for construction trains. It'd have trains going, shuttling back and forth between here and right. Right is at the border of the county, basically, at the t highest end of Los Gatos Creek, right before it crossed under the mountain through a long tunnel and went into Santa Cruz County. So when they were constructing it, they had a turntable there, and they had a turntable in Los Gatos, so trains could just be turned around and sent back the other way. Um, and then in later years, they needed a turntable for their switch engine so they could come in and out of the, uh, the engine house. So, Grove Park, something people don't really think too much about uh, when they think about Los Gatos these days, because anybody know where Grove Park was? Maybe somebody read my book and remembers. <laughs> Grove Park is under 17. Um, if you go over Main Street, on the, or over Highway 17 on the Main Street Bridge, you're pretty much on top of Grove Park. Uh, when the highway was built uh, and diverted away from uh, Santa Cruz Avenue, it went right on top of Grove Park. The reason why Oak Meadow Park exists is because the, county, or the city felt bad about paving over their nicest park, so they made a new park next to Vasona Park. That's why you have Vasona Park, which is huge, and right next to it you have a completely different park tucked in, even though it doesn't really make sense for there to be two parks there. But that was their little consolation. Like, we'll give you this. But so Grove Park was kind of the first South Pacific Coast picnic stop in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And you don't think of this because most people who've read anything about local railroading history, they think of Sunset Park, which is way up near Wright. That only opened in 1896. So for the first 18 years the railroad was running, that wasn't a thing. So they had to go other places. And yeah, they went to Big Trees, which is Henry Cowell uh, Park in Felton. And they went to Boulder Creek. They had a number of parks in the Boulder Creek branch. But if people are just going on a mountain route, they want quick and easy access to a park. Well, what's quicker and easier than just going to Los Gatos Station, getting off the train, and going down the hillside behind it? Because that's all it was. You went to the post office today, where the station used to be, you go behind it, and you go down. There's still Park Street, I believe, named that, and that is all that's left of Gro Grove uh, Park, is Park Street, which is a very short little road that used to be a little bit longer. <laughs> so. The trains started going there in 1878. It was unincorporated. It's not clear who owned it. Probably Linden owned it at the time, but nobody really was charging anything for it. Then in 1881, a guy named William Cadwell Shore bought the property, and he was the one that named it Grove Park. So that's what kind of became an official park. And it thrived for about six years. And then I've been talking with uh, Peggy about this. So the, the dates are a little bit confusing. But what happened is in the late 1880s, Los Gatos Incorporated, in 1887, Los Gatos Incorporated as a city. And it seems one of the things that may have been motivating them at this time is the temperance movement. Temperance in all these little towns that had lots of logging and kind of dark, seedy cultures, and Los Gatos at this time was a little seedy. They really, they yet, let's just say you had the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which is a nice group of Christian ladies who did not want people getting drunk every day all the time. <laughs> and so what do railroads at picnic stops usually do? Well, they get people drunk all the time. That picnic stops, their entire purpose was basically to get people out of town and get them drunk someplace else. Um, and that is no different here. In fact, the Ten Mile House, which became the Los Gatos Hotel, it was a bar on its first floor, and it had a big first floor. And from what I hear, in the summers, that place was packed. And it's because everybody was going to Grove Park, and then they'd go over there to get some alcohol, and maybe go back to the park, and go back to the hotel. Everybody was getting drunk. Lexington was notorious for how drunk it was because it was a logging town, so there's far more men there than women during the harvesting season there were bars everywhere. And it's heyday, there's apparently a, a mile of bars between Lexington and Alma. So <laughs> drunkenness was a problem at this time. So when the city incorporated, they could suddenly enforce temperance laws. It's harder for a town, uh, unincorporated town to do it. So in 1887, they incorporated, and even though the actual law didn't go into place until 89, and in fact, it got overturned almost immediately for a liquor license, it doesn't change the fact that the coincidence of dates here is, is I, I think it's very telling. 1887, they incorporate. 1888, Forest Grove opens up. Forest Grove was about another mile past Alma, so we're looking now four miles-ish south of here. 
it was owned by the Southern Pacific. Well, it was owned by a, a leading figure of the Southern Pacific. It was a picnic stop. For about 10 years, all the trains went to this picnic stop. They did not go to Los Gatos anymore. And the railroad was able to pretty much turn it into their own little Disneyland. We can bring our own alcohol so we can charge more for it, but there's no laws stopping anybody from doing whatever they want, mostly getting drunk. And so that's exactly what happened. So Grove Park only lasted about 10 years as this kind of seedy alcohol resort before the city just had enough of it and sent them away. And it kind of backfired, but we'll get to that in a minute. So, yeah, and then in 1896, the railroad officially opened Sunset Park. That lasted for seven year, or nine years. And right before the earthquake in 1906, they stopped doing those because it was just chaos. Everybody was drunk. They apparently were literally bodily throwing people off trains because they were so rowdy. And the police stopped enforcing laws on the trains because they kept getting beaten up. And they said, you know what? That's just, and the Southern Pacific just had enough. And so by, in 1905, they just said, we're done. No more picnic trains to the Santa Cruz Mountains because apparently if you go there, you just get stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> Again, coincidence with dates. Sunset Parks opens in 1896, so any remaining traffic at all that was going to uh, Los Gatos, maybe corporate picnics seem to have still been a big thing. You know, you're not supposed to be as drunk in a corporate picnic. Well, even those got diverted to Sunset Park. So in 1897, the park actually reincorporated, Shore donated all their land to the city. It got refounded as Bunker Hill Park. It became Memorial Park after World War I. Uh, and it stopped pretty much being a stop of any sort for the railroad. Um, so from 1896, once it was Bunker Hill Park, it was not a railroad stop anymore. And so here's some pictures. This is William uh, Cadwell Shore. This is actually probably the day that Bunker Hill Park was officially founded. So because it's 1897, I suspect this is him at the park he had just <coughs> donated to the city. He's holding a little puppy there. Uh, here's a, a picnic, 1882 at the park. A bunch of guys with some meat, it looks like. In fact, I think that's a butcher because he's holding a knife. <laughs> uh, this is a busy day at the park. You can see they bring their wagons right up. And lots of oak trees and sycamore trees were there. Then this is some fun pictures I found of um, people leaving the town. So these are further up in the hills at where once the railroad, uh, or once the Grove Park and the town went dry and everything, people went elsewhere. So these guys here, they have alcohol and just for fun, they also have some guns uh, at least that's what the caption says. I cannot find any guns in here, but the caption for the photo originally said it had guns. But they certainly have alcohol. There's some on the stump there. And yeah, they're just having a picnic. They have their little wagon bus. There's another group out in the woods, just somewhere on Los Gatos Creek. Here's a nice close-up of a group around 1900. They got alcohol again up on the table. <laughs> so obviously prohibition happened in, in uh, 1920. Well, then all of a sudden it wasn't an issue. Everybody was temperate officially, so there no longer was an issue with that. But by this point, Los Gatos was already kind of failing as a picnic stop. It was still a railroad stop, and it would continue to be a railroad stop through the 50s. But as a tourist destination, that really ended in 1887, 1888, when the picnic stops went away. But it still was a freight area, and so, and then these are just some interesting things that happened in the 1880s that really helped develop the town. You got the weekly news that's beginning in 1881. Two years later, you get the, the mail. So you got two newspapers, very short period of time, in a town that had almost overnight become this huge area where previously it had just been kind of a sleepy town that was struggling to rival Lexington. Uh, Union Ice Company, which is different, that was actually, Union Ice Company was founded by, um, William Shore, uh, just beyond the depot. It was actually underneath the water tower there. And it did the same exact thing. It was for, mostly for um, agricultural products uh, so they could stay cold. Uh, I skipped this one, but Los Gatos Fruit Packing Company there, 1882. I knew it was founded early. So that was a full cannery. Uh, I've got a couple pictures of that. It was a full cannery that developed uh, right downtown. Sacred Heart Novitiates founded its winery above town in 1886 and actually built it in 1888. That has continued to be a presence in the area. You can still see some of the buildings up on the hill. It's a very, I mean, they shipped everything out on the railroad. People don't think about it, but the wine that they sold was sold in barrels that was carted down to the depot and then shipped out. 
And then the first major school in the area was built in 1886. So by 1887, the population was 1,500. So it had more than tripled. Actually, I have another stat. I have the stat for 1890, uh, where it literally did triple in size by the 1890 census. And again, this probably included the villages that were south of here. But the town was definitely getting large. It was sprawling one mile on either side of the creek by this point. So it's not a whole lot different than really, like it's, its range was, isn't a whole lot different than Los Gatos today is. It's just more densely packed now. Uh, it was officially incorporated August 10th, 1887. Oh, there, <laughs> I put the date twice. So 1652 was the population. So these are just some of the fun things that popped up in the town during this time. So 1881, this is the weekly news building, very nondescript, but got that. This is the cannery. So this is a little bit later, this is 1895, but the tracks went right through the middle of it. I mean, these are all packing houses and barns, or er, um, freight barns for it. Very crowded area here. And in later years, they strangely fit a second spur. I cannot rectify the pictures of the second spur, or the maps that show a second spur with this picture at all, though. So I'm not quite sure how that worked out, but they apparently had two tracks in this yard. My battery finally dying on this thing. There you go. So this is the Union Ice Company. Uh, it's in the north end of the railroad yard. 1884, yeah, it was founded. And just really fun, there's actually a guy on a telephone here. This is very early oh, years. Goodness. Well, you can see that the telephone technology had already re reached Los Gatos. And so, yeah, it's going into the window. And uh, I believe William Short's son is this guy here. Why did you stop working? You have to move up. All right, the Central School, built in 1886. Um, this was a nice big one. This was. Peggy, actually, you could probably help me with this. Was this one on the East Bank or the West Bank? I couldn't find out. <laughs> this one was on what's now University Avenue. Okay, that's what I thought. So this was also on the West Bank then, yeah. on what was School Road or School Avenue. Um, I don't know if it was a road or avenue because the signs just call it school. All right, and then there was a number of colorful, uh, colorized postcards of the novitiates. Uh, this was one of them. They had... Their main thing up there, they were owned by the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus uh, of the Catholic Church, but they, their number one product was making wine for communion. So they made a lot of wine for communion and sold it all over the state, and sometimes that wine for communion just didn't happen to make it into churches, so they sold it elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you have an overstock, you might there, as well make a lot. Yeah. It's actually novitiate. It's a singular... It's where the novices would go. It's the That's true, yeah. young Jesuits would go and they'd work in the vineyard. And when they spoke, they were only allowed to speak in Latin to keep the conversation down. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, novitiate. And there's just another picture a little bit farther back. This is from 1893. And so you can see this is their main processing facility for the vineyard. And that was the actual school um, training area and the dormitories over there. I'm not sure what this building in the front is. Could have been the head priest's house. Uh, this photo doesn't actually have a whole lot of purpose. It just, I thought it was really cool. This is a, a meat market that was right on Santa Cruz Avenue. He got the two butchers in front again with a butcher knife and he's got pig probably, maybe cow. I'm not even sure what that is. But just showing some of the activity that was happening on the road. And then this one is very interesting. I'll read the caption for this because I can't actually explain it. Uh, this was... The formation of the Zouaves uh, Guard, they were homemade uniforms fashioned after the French Algerian mercenaries at the time of the Civil War. Uh, and they used the, this society was made to indoctrinate boys with military skills and tactics. Uh, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, really wanted to celebrate this group. So this was from 1885 on a July 4th demonstration. So They still exist at Purdue. I was a member. Interesting. Uh, I did not know that. In 1950, the early 1950s. Well, there you go. Yeah, I didn't even know they existed still. But yeah, you can see the uh, that's Los Gatos Depot right next to it. So they're set up for a parade ground right in front of the depot. And then, so yeah, basically what happened after this is once the town was founded in its kind of modern form, things would things progressed as a town does. 
they continued to use freight service. They still had regular passenger service for years here. Um, the tracks were standard gauge in 1895, but the interesting thing is they were not standard gauge for use by the locals at the time. What, happened, or what happens when you have dual gauge, or, uh, two different systems operating, you have to transfer that stuff. The narrow gauge trains would have to go all the way up to a, a transfer yard and switch everything over to a standard gauge train in most cases unless they happen to be on the same network. And at this time, most of the tracks coming from Alameda Point to San Jose were already standard gauge and they were starting to throw out what or they call it throwing out the third rail, throwing out the narrow gauge rail. So slowly but surely it came to Los Gatos and the local businesses here like the canneries and the wineries, they wanted to be able to skip that extra process of transferring. So it was pretty easy to get the third uh, to the standard gauge tracks to Los Gatos and they did. But that happened in 1895, but the railroad system still wasn't prepared to switch over their passenger service yet. So it was another five years. It was only April 15th, 1900, that standard gauge service operated here. And that still wasn't the end of narrow gauge because the Forbes mill, the Los, was it, at this point it would be the ice and electric plant, they were still on narrow gauge and they'd stay on narrow gauge until the narrow gauge was demolished and in 1909, basically they ceased to exist as a railroad stop because there just weren't any narrow gauge trains that could use that line anymore. I think the tracks actually survived for a number of years, but PG&E eventually bought it out in 1913, and in 1916 they demolished everything except for the little piece of the Forbes mill that still survives today, that little annex building that was just a grain warehouse originally. The whole rest of the building, just three and a half stories, gone. And PG&E turned that little thing that used to be the museum here, like the Los Gatos Museum, they turned that little, um, grain house into a power substation for years. And so that was, so the narrow gauge was done there, but the route over the mountain needed an extra little kick. And well, nature, earth, whatever you want to say, gave it that kick in 1906 when the earthquake literally kicked it, messed up the line completely, and they decided, well, this is a great opportunity. The line's already closed. We're just standard gauge the whole thing. So in 1909, the entire line was standard gauged, and that was great for the railroad. They no longer had to deal with these narrow gauge cars. It stunk, though, because the trains were way more efficient. Los Gatos never was going to recover from this. They never needed to stop in Los Gatos anymore except for their regular passenger service. So Los Gatos, any remnant of uh, picnic lines, excursion trains, anything that used to come to Los Gatos, pretty much ended in 1909 when the line was rebuilt as a standard gauge. And that was just kind of it. The town kept developing, it did great, but I mean, you're all here in Los Gatos. <laughs> town did great, but the railroad as a picnic line, as Los Gatos as a destination that you go on your map and go like, oh, I wanna go to Los Gatos because I heard they're a really good picnic stop, just gone. So 1909, anything that was left is gone by that point. I have two pictures. Sunset Park right after the earthquake to a location in the uh, yeah. end of the Alameda Valley. Yeah, exactly. they moved after the earthquake, yeah. They were supposed to move before the earthquake, but the earthquake delayed things a bit. And so, yeah, here's a picture from 1900. Uh, you can see the over to the right, that is the uh, Hotel Linden after it was already rebuilt um, when it burned down. And this is still, a, this is still narrow gauge here. Um, the depot a little, or it seems to be a little bit bigger at this point, but the tracks here, you can see the train is still a South Pacific Coast train. It has a low number. The, uh, the Southern Pacific usually had much higher numbers than six. And you can see all the wagons. But then this is just a little bit afterwards, and this is the first standard gauge passenger train to enter the town. Look at the frenzy of activity. There's so many people around. They're all having fun. You can see the station. You can see the freight warehouse. Still pretty open back there because that's mostly the park still. I mean, even though it wasn't being used for excursions, it's still the park in that area, but just so many wagons and everything. And yeah, that is basically it. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you to all these people that helped out.